We have all heard how important it is to make sure you are working on your SEO and content. But oftentimes, I hear entrepreneurs admit that they feel like they're walking in the weeds when it comes to knowing if what they're doing is actually working. I had my interview with Ryan on July 9th, and let me tell you, I am still working through all the great tips and ideas he packed into this episode. On top of all of those things, he left us with so many great resources that you can use to level up today. And let me tell you, I've tried a couple of them, and they are amazing. Trust me when I say you're going to need a pen and paper for this one because you are going to be leaving with so many notes. Welcome to Fox Talks Business Podcast with your host, Tanya Fox. Tanya has been an entrepreneur for over 20 years, owning retail, service, and franchise. She holds no punches and is never afraid to talk about the nitty gritty. Together, you'll explore the good, the bad, and the motivational of business life, turning obstacles into opportunities and failures into successes. So grab your favorite drink and let's have some fun. Here's your host, speaker, crafter, and collaborator, Tanya Fox. So thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Ryan. Thanks, Tanya. Happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about your story, sort of how you came to join the family business. Yes, yeah, so I, I went to school for marketing, um, did not have any, have any plans of going into the business. Um, that I can, that I can remember. And so I had two jobs outside of college. They were, they were marketing related. They were like in the direct mail space doing like what's called list brokerage, like helping companies choose the right lists for their direct mail campaigns. So, you know, I was still in sort of like circling the, the, the top, the, 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 what, what Ballantyne does, but had no plans on it. Then my brother went into company like 2003, my brother, Matt, I think that's like when I started thinking, oh, it'd be kind of cool to work with my brother, my uncle, my dad were there. Um, but that's, I think that's when the plant the seed was planted. And so I approached my dad and my uncle about working for the company there at that time, there was no marketing person. They just did direct sales, like cold calling and trade shows and stuff like that. So they created a role for me in 2003. That's when the adventure started. So tell us a little bit about the history of the company. Cause it's quite an interesting history. <clears throat> yeah. So it goes back to the mid sixties. My great uncle started the company in 1966. My grandfather joined in 68. My dad in 78, uncle in 84. And there's been a couple of cotes, you know, throughout that as well. Um, and now fast forward to today, we do direct mail and digital marketing. So we just used to do direct mail marketing. And then we've, now we've evolved over the last five years to do direct mail and digital marketing. So now we have a full, full team for, you know, print and digital. Um, and, you know, my brother, my two brothers are in the business. My, my second brother joined in 2014. And so now him, um, my, my brother, Matt, myself, my uncle are partners in the business and my cousin joined two years ago. So it's like a big, happy family affair. It's like Thanksgiving every day, <laughs> <laughs> which could be a good or a bad thing. Sometimes <laughs> it's usually, it's usually good, you know, <laughs> Not so always, but. your company primarily deals with s smaller businesses. And one of the things that I think um, small businesses get trapped in is thinking that their advertising needs to be small as well, or they don't feel like they can play on the same field as other companies. So can you talk to us a little bit about that and how some tips that they can use to sort of up their game? Sure. I mean, we're a small business. Uh, most of our clients in the digital side are small businesses. So uh, this question is like right in my wheelhouse because it's what we do every day. Um, yeah, so I, for me, like the internet's really level the playing field because we all have access to the same tools, the same platforms, the same strategies as the huge companies or the big competitors. Of course, their budget might be bigger in terms of what they can actually put into it, but we still have access to the same resources. And so um, it's really about using, I mean, that said though, I want to take a step back because you also don't want to dilute yourself too much. And so it really depends on what your budget is and what your time resources are. Um, I always recommend the clients to, you know, to be more like a laser beam instead of a light bulb, same wattage, but more focused. Um, and so we always start with like the core strategies that are most likely going to go in to get them leads. That's what clients are coming to us for. I'm sure that's what your listeners want. They want more leads. You know, brand awareness is great, but if you're a typical small business, um, it's all, it's, you know, the leads are important as well. And so you know, for that, it comes down to search engine optimization. It comes down to paid advertising. 
Um, why both of those strategies? Because they both go after keywords. And so someone has a need, they're going into Google and they're typing, you know, they're typing their, whatever they're looking for. Let's say it's um, someone has a health issue. Maybe they're looking for the particular service or they're describing their symptoms, looking for a solution, whatever the case is, they have a need and they're going to Google. And so typically when that person lands on your site, they have a higher intent to buy. And that's why they turn, they tend to turn to leads more often than other strategies. Um, I'm a huge, and I, I can, I can go into tips about, if you're saying, okay, well, I don't want to start with both. What would I start, which I start with, I would say SEO because with paid search, you're paying for every click and it can get very expensive if you don't know what you're doing. And I can give tips around SEO. Um, but to round off this answer, I'm a huge fan of content and that's, what, that's anything that, that that's something that any small business owner can do. Um, and if you don't want to write, you can easily outsource it, find the right writer. Um, I give some from tips around that, some tips around that. But content creation is so key for, for us because, you know, it, it's got multiple uses. You put it on your website and it's going to rank eventually for some terms for Google. So it sort of becomes SEO. It enables you to um, demonstrate your thought leadership. It's a piece of asset. It's a piece of asset that you can put on your social media. So it's, you repurp it's easily repurposable. You can share it with your email list. Um, and so I'm a big fan of content. And I, and I actually see it coming back a lot now because... I see Google ranking a lot more blogs because they answer questions. Um, a lot of voice search queries are questions. So there's Google discover on your Android phone. And so it just has a lot of, a lot of purposes. And that's why I love content. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes businesses, you know, and maybe we should go into that because I think that can get overwhelming of thinking, well, I don't know what to write about. Like, I don't know what is going to interest people. And so then they get stuck in that loop of going, I don't know if I really have all that interesting stuff to say that people want to do or the time to sit down and write for all of these different platforms. So yeah, definitely some, you know, if you can let us know some tips on, you know, how to find the right person. Cause of course you want the content to be written, but you also want it to sound like it's you and like it's your business. So actually that last part you said um, made me think of a way that we do content. I think your, your listeners could uh, benefit from because it makes it easy to create the content, but you don't necessarily want to spend the time to write it. We actually created the strategy because uh, we have a lot of like technical manufacturing clients. That's one of the areas that we really hyper-focus on. Um, and some of it's technical, you know, we're speaking to engineers and as much as we try to learn about the business, it's just, there's often a disconnect because they know so much more, you know? Right. Um, and so what we started doing is we started doing transcription, uh, content. So basically interviewing them for 10 to 15 minutes per article. Okay. Transcribing that conversation and then edit it, editing it, editing it into a blog post. And then of course, optimizing and all that. So basically the way that worked for your listeners is, you know, someone can interview them. So have a phone call, record it, and then they, you're calling, they can take the recording, transcribe it, and then have someone edit it or they can edit it into a blog post. So that cuts down like, like half the work because you're not, you know, you're not sitting down and, okay, what am I going to write now? Typing, you know, and you just talking out, it's much easier to talk. And then you transcribe it and edit it into a blog post. It's been a, it's been a game, game changer for us. Yeah. And it's so funny because a lot of times when I'm sitting and I don't know why I've never thought of this, but a lot of times when I'm sitting in my car, I have a voice recorder for, cause usually it's when I'm on the road that I come up with what I think are brilliant ideas, but I never thought of getting somebody to transcribe all of that and use it as content. It was just, you know, getting ideas out or questions that I think people might answer or stuff like that. So I, there might be other people that are doing that, that have all of this content sitting there and they don't even realize that that they can use that as content. I actually like, I like your idea better. What you just said there for your, for your listeners is using, I don't know why you, know, you just have your, your phone has a recorder on it. Yeah. Just talk into it and then get that tra transcribed. If you're looking for a resource for transcriptions, it's just the one we use. We're not affiliated with, with them. Um, a speech pad, they like speech, speech pad, P A D. There's tons of, I mean, I, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know how they compare price wise to the competitors, but yeah, speak into your phone. And then send that transcription, send that audio to a transcriber. They're going to send you back a whole big audio, a big text file with the content. And then just either get someone to edit it or edit it yourself into a blog post. Yeah. So we hear a lot about SEO. Everybody's saying you have to pay attention to that. You have to do that. But 
sometimes we don't like, there's a lot of people that are like, well, that's, that's great. I, I know what the letters stand for and I've got that in my head, but I'm really not too sure how, you know, how I can actually improve that ranking. So can you give us some advice on how we can do that? Sure. I mean, SEO is, uh, it's what we, so we started the digital side of Ballantyne. Um, it really was just SEO because that's what I kind of grew up learning, I guess. That's what I taught myself. I've always had like entrepreneurial things on the side, like e-commerce sites and stuff like that. So I started teaching myself SEO and then started taking it really seriously and just consume as much as I can about it. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to today, we do a lot of it for, for clients. Um, so, and while I'm not doing the work anymore, I'm still heavily invested in learning more about it and keeping up with it. So to answer your question, um, there's a lot of ways we can go about this. Um, I would say, for take for actionable takeaways, it starts with keyword research. Okay. You have to, when you're creating content, when you're optimizing your pages, you have to have an idea of what keywords you're going to optimize for, uh, because it doesn't make sense to optimize for keywords that no one's searching for. Right. So how do you do that? Well, there's tools out there. Uh, we like Uber suggest, um, we use SEM rush too, but that's a more enterprise premium tool. Uber suggests is like 80% of the way there and it's only $10 a month, at least right now it is. Right. And so it's very, very affordable, very worth, worth the investment. And it does other stuff too. Like it analyzes your site for issues, SEO issues, not affiliated with them. Just it's a tool that I recommend that uh, your listeners check out. And so you, you use Uber suggest and you plug in the keywords like, okay, I think uh, someone's going to type in this. You search, you search for the keyword and it'll, it'll spit out a whole list of related keywords with all the, um, search volume metrics and how competitive it is and all that. So use that tool to get a good idea of what your audience is actually searching for. So that's the foundation. You have to have a good idea of the keywords. And then once you have the keywords, you use those keywords as um, topics for the content. Don't make it too SEO. Just use the, the keywords inf to influence the topics. Um, and then you want to make sure that the keywords are in the, in the right spots on your website. And I can get really technical here, but to no, please do. <laughs> I'm enjoying yeah, okay. this. I'm like, okay, noting, noting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then, um, all right. So when you get the keywords, you want to put it, here's the key spots to put the keywords in the title tag, the meta description, headlines, the body content, the image tags. That's like most of, most of it. There's more that goes into it than that, obviously, but title tag, meta description, um, what I say? Headlines body content, image tags. If you want a good, um, good resource to learn more about this, there's a blog called Backlinko. So Backlink with an O at the end, Backlinko. He's got some cr crazy guides on, on what's called on-page optimization. That's what we're talking about. Taking keywords and adding them to the, adding them to the, um, the website. It's called on-page optimization. He's got some crazy guides about that. It goes into much more detail than what I'm saying, but um, it's a very good resource if you want to get really, uh, if you want to learn a lot. Yeah. Um, Oh, so you had a question? Well, and I think, I think that's a great point because I think we hear, you know, hear a lot about keywords and we sort of do a guessing game. I think a lot of people do a guessing game on what people are searching for, but it might not necessarily be what's driving people to eventually find your site. You know, yeah. I think a lot of businesses sort of play a guessing game and go, well, I think they would do this. This is the main product that I do. So I'm just going to constantly use this keyword when maybe that's not the, you know, maybe there's a, a, a different word that's going to help you better. So I love that, that you gave that, um, the Uber suggest, I think will come in really handy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the tool. So, and you're right. You, you need to have a, an idea of what people are searching for. It's going to, it'll transform everything, your content and your SEO. Um, so that's, that's like pillar number one. Um, pillar number two, I would say, let's get the foundations, right? Mobile friendly website, uh, fast loading website and, um, fast loading website, mobile friendly website. And I would say nothing broken on the site, no broken links, you know, and that's, that tool Uber suggests will show that as well, because it's hard to really, you know, you're not going to go page by page looking at all your links. And so it's, you know, you want to make sure technically your site is, is strong and also use secure URLs, HTTPS. Most of your listeners will probably have all those boxes checked now but not always. And so it's a good, it's, it's a good reminder. That's pillar number two. Um, pillar number three would be link building. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you heard the term link building, but that's getting other sites to link back to your site. 
it's almost like a vote for your website. Right. You know, from Google's eyes, if site A is linking to site B, site A is voting for site B. And the stronger the vote, the better the vote. So a link from like CNN is going to be very good versus a site with like a, from a spammy blogger, which would be like the worst kind of link you can get. So right. the links do matter um, and the quality of the sites do matter. How do you do it? The best way right now is to write content for related sites that you have relationships with. You know, they want the content. Um, they want the content and, you know, you want the link. So you write the content for them and they publish it on their site and you get a link. It's called guest posting. It's very common nowadays. It's more labor intensive, but, you know, the more labor intensive a link is, usually the better it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of like what I've learned from doing these podcast interviews is you get links from podcast interviews too. It's not why I'm doing it, but you know, from the, from the show notes page, typically the, um, the host will link back to the website. Yep. And so it's been sort of like a side benefit. So that's something, I guess, a takeaway for your listeners as well. And I think that that's, you know, it, it, I think it's true. I think podcasts are, you know, are coming uh, I'm glad they're, they're coming up. I've only been doing it for like a year and a half, but I think it's, it's a great way if you have that to, I mean, half of the content that I do is really not my content. It's regurgitated, amazing advice from all of my guests. But yeah, I never thought of really like reusing my content to actually do guest posting for people that are looking for, say an example for me would be, I talk a lot about collaboration, but I've sort of been hoarding all of my stuff and not thinking maybe I should write some articles or write some, you know, um, some content and share it out. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure it's unique content. If you've got, if you've got content on your site, that's already published and you publish it somewhere else for a backlink, then you've got two pages that have the same exact content. And that's the, first of all, the person that's taking the content, they won't want that because they don't want right. the duplicate content either. The duplicate content can hurt. So the best case scenario is like, let's say you're creating weekly content for yourself. Maybe two pieces of content go up in your blog and then two pieces of content you use for guest posting. Just kind of say, Hey, I wrote this. Do you want it? Mm -hmm. um, if they don't, then you publish it on your site. If you can't find any takers for it, then you publish it on your site. Um, that would be a good kind of rinse and repeat type of strategy to do every month. It kind of checks off a lot of boxes, the content that you want on your site for SEO, for, you know, just Google loves fresh content. And then you're using the, the other two pieces for getting backlinks to your site. And Google likes that as well. Mm -hmm. I've got one more tip, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so the last part I'm going to mention here um, would be something that we've taken a very strong interest in lately. Um, and it's super, super important for local businesses is, is Google my business. It fuels Google maps. Uh, most listeners probably have a verified listing. If you don't go to google.com forward slash business, verify your, verify your site in there and then fully fill it out. Like just the whole thing. So your, your name, your address, your phone number, your website, your services, your products, um, photos, just, just go crazy on it. Um, why? Because Google, my business, it fuels Google maps. So when you have a strong listing, it helps you rank better in Google maps. Google.com also injects Google maps into their regular search results. So you don't, you, when you have your maps listing, you rank in maps, but you can also rank in the Google search results. You'll see if you do a search for like, um, you know, uh, Fairfield, New Jersey plumber or something like that. There'll be, or there'll be ads, there'll be the organic list results, but then there'll also be a little section for the map. Right. Yeah. So it's got, you, you can rank in both areas. I mean, here's the other reason why if you do a search for someone's company, usually the right sidebar, almost always, unless you have a very generic company name, the right sidebar is dedicated to your Google, my business information. So unfortunately, Valentine, we share it with uh, whiskey and beer, and they're just bigger brands. So if you type in Valentine, the whiskey shows. Um, but if you type in Valentine Corp or Valentine NJ, our Google My Business listing shows up, and it shows our photos, it shows all our reviews, our social profiles, our, you know, everything. And it, it really sets a, a really good first impression. Someone's going to, if someone's looking to do business with you, they're probably going to search for your name, okay? And then the first thing they're likely going to see, because it's going to draw their eye to it, is the Google My Business information. So if you've got a lot of reviews, good reviews, photos, then they click over to your site. They've already, they're already framed in a more positive light, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And do you find, and I think that's true. I think I know I do that. Like if somebody recommends a company to me, uh, you know, or says, you know, you should, 
you know, here's this great company, they sell this great product. I still go online and I'll Google them and see what, what, the, how they come up, you know, what yeah. the review, you know, what the other, the strangers reviews type of thing are of them. Well, I, I most do. I think that's, I think that's, that's common behavior. It's like human nature, you know, before you, um, even a referral, they're going to still want to see what you have going on. You know, it's the net, every, everyone searches like Googling things. It's like they, everyone searches for, I mean, we work with some manufacturers that, that produce the most obscure products. You would never ever hear of unless you're doing business with them and their products get a lot of searches. And so it's just like human behavior to search. And especially when you're thinking about doing business with someone, they're going to probably look you up. So yeah, you to make sure it's rock solid. So, um, we hear a lot, and I know you had mentioned it briefly about brand awareness and people are, you know, I think that we're getting inundated with people saying, you know, your brand is so important of, you know, what you put out there, but how do you raise that? So can you give us some tips on how you can raise brand awareness sort of in the real world, I guess? <laughs> yeah, sure. And so when I said before that brand awareness, I mean, leads and brand awareness for a small, for a small business, brand awareness still is important. Um, obviously, you can't take it to the level like Coca-Cola does, of course, but brand awareness is still important because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the ranking factors we're seeing now um, is that Google is using more, about, more, more brand signals. And it makes sense. If you think about it from their point of view, if someone's typing in car and you've got, what's like two big brands, like the uh, Mercedes and BMW, okay? Those, um, their, their websites are probably equally as strong. They, you know, they have... You know, same amount of marketing, probably the same amount of domain strength, okay? But which one has more brand searches? It would make sense for Google to rank the domain that for cars, the one with the most brands, the most brand searches. So if BMW is getting like um, 500,000 searches a month for that term and Mercedes is getting a million, from Google's point of view, it, logically it would make sense to show Mercedes at the top spot because it's more popular. So if someone's searching for a car, they might, you know, so that's, we're starting to see that transition over into the small business world as well. And so um, it makes sense to try to invest some of your marketing efforts into brand awareness. So how do you do that? Um, online PR, it still is effective in that regard because it pushes your name out there. As well, make sure you have your name in the, in the headline of the story and you know, make sure the story is newsworthy. Um, what, how would you do that? We like um, e-releases, but there's tons of different services out there. So push it out. Make sure it's newsworthy. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be every month, but just when you have something to say. Uh, that's where the content comes into play. Uh, making sure that your content is really good. It's attracting a lot of eyeballs. The more popular it gets, the more people see the brand. Like we wrote, a, we wrote an article two or three years ago about the Facebook algorithm changes. And it ranks like one or two for all those searches. And those searches like around December, January, February, man, they just go, true. Right. So that, that article... It goes through with it, you know, because the traffic, because everyone's searching and they're finding it. And so more and more people are seeing Valentine, Valentine. Um, so you could follow the same strategy with your content. And then social media, you know, um, you know, that's, that's another place to position your, you know, your thought leadership and your authority, which ties into brand awareness. So I would say, you know, pick a, a social platform and then really own it. I wouldn't get too diluted with Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and just, just focus on one and make it really good. Um, create good content. I think you do those two things along with like PR when it makes sense for your business. That's, that's going to get you pretty far. Yeah. And I think too, like people try to go, like you were saying before, they try to go so big. They try to saturate as much as they can for the market instead of really targeting in. And I know I have found like, even for working on your brand, it, it's good to target in, like you said, having that laser beam where you're not just trying to be you know, the jack of all trades to, to everybody. It's, you know what, that's, um, that actually ties into a lesson that we learned because 2017, I think it was, we started losing a lot of clients and big clients. And we're like, shoot, what's going on here? And so we took a step back and we were like, okay, well, who do we serve best? And then let's just focus on them. And we did that. And then it just turned things around I wouldn't say like super quickly, but it felt quick because clients are coming in. And so, yeah, I think having that hyper focus on who you work with, how you market yourself, um, I think it's very, very important. So in, 
now I know you're working with family, so there's that whole dynamic, but can you think of a time that you sort of had a struggle um, being, you know, an entrepreneur and how you overcame it? I think that actually, not knowing that question was coming, that actually kind of ties into what you said before when 2017, and I can go more into that story. Mm -hmm. We started losing big clients and it was sort of like a gradual thing. Like I remember it was like February, we lost a big client that I wasn't expecting to lose. And I was like, huh, okay, that stinks. And then it just like, and these were like top five clients. And then like happened like two months later. And then, and then by the fall, when we just like, it was obvious something was wrong. Cause like you lose clients. It's like natural. You're not going to work with everyone, you know, clients forever. forever. Yeah. But you know, when they happen, like the big clients happen like two month increments, you get to a point where we're like, oh boy. And so, um, that's actually when I started getting big into like personal development. Cause I was like, something's wrong here. Like I got to fix, fix something. So I started getting really into personal development, doing morning routine, getting my head straight, you know, um, exercising, joined the boxing club. Cause I feel like, you know, a lot of what you have to fix is in here. And so did that. Um, and then, like I said, sat with my brothers, my uncle, like, okay, for digital, who do we focus, who do we do best for? And that's, you know, uh, contractors and manufacturers, you know, that, you know, that's, that seems to be our sweet spot. And so we just started really focusing on that. And, you know, that was definitely the biggest struggle because it felt like the, it felt like the sky was falling down on us. Um, fortunately, didn't have to lay anyone, lay anyone off because the turnaround happened fairly quickly. And we had the print side of the business, which was doing really well then. So, of course, that helps. Um, but, yeah, we focus on the niche and then I focus on myself and it's, it got a lot better. And I think that that's a key thing because I think we get stuck in – the routine as entrepreneurs and we just go with it when things are going really good we just kind of go with the flow and it's only when those moments hit us where something all of a sudden drastically changes that we tend to stop <laughs> take a look and go hmm maybe something sort of needs to change so from that do you find that you you um that targeting in on you know what they say your ideal client is really is something that you guys focus on a lot more now because of that experience it is and it's funny though because then we started drifting away from it and we started working with auto dealerships which we still love working with auto dealerships we have clients and it's great work but then we started taking smaller clients because they were maybe it was because they were easier wins and it like it felt good i don't know what what the I don't, I, you know, remember the reasoning for it, but we started taking like nonprofits and we started kind of drifting away from, you know, what we had learned back then. Uh, and then with COVID coronavirus, um, you know, clients were pausing and we're cutting back and we're trying to work with them the best we can. And, and then we, we again got ourselves refocused and now we're again, focused on contractors and manufacturers. Um, and especially because, you know, they're also less, uh, prone to the COVID, like our manufacturing clients haven't been as, as hurt. They mm -hmm. have been, of course, but not as much. Um, contractors, now that you know, I'm in New Jersey, now that New Jersey is open again, you know, in terms of like that business, construction, construction, they're hurting less. And so we, we, we chose those two niches again, because A, we serve them best and B, it made sense for right now. So I feel like this entrepreneurial journey, it's, it's never going to end in terms of like the ups and downs. Like you, you learn a lesson and then you slowly forget it. And then you're like, oh shoot, time to learn it again. I think that's, that's across a lot of areas of business. Yeah, I agree with you. So if a business is interested in, um, you know, working with you guys, what is sort of like, do you have a certain area? Is your area of the world that you're working with? And how would the, they go about finding you? So if you've asked me that question five or six months ago, I would have said, try sit area. But now, now that we're all like video chat experts, uh, we are actually getting clients from all over the U S so it doesn't really matter for us. Um, but I put together a page for your, for your listeners. Okay. And on there is a, an offer for a free video analysis where I'll go through your site. I'll look at it from an SEO standpoint. I'll look at your social too. And just whatever, I, whatever tips I can, whatever tips I see feedback that I think is worthwhile. I'll mention in the video, it's a, a screen share. Um, and that, if you go to ballantine.com slash Fox talks, okay. Fox talks, you'll see the offer there. And, and plus you can check me on LinkedIn as well. That my link is there. On yeah. That page. That's great. Well, thank you so much for that offer. The, definitely. I think a lot of people will benefit from that. Thank you. So I appreciate you so much taking time today to talk to us and all of the tips. There's so many, my page is full. So thank you so much. <laughs> thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for listening. 
Now you see why I said you were going to need a pen and piece of paper. I have pages of notes of action items and websites and tips that I am so excited to try out myself. I cannot wait to hear what you took away from this episode and what thing you're going to try to get your business to the next level. Now, don't forget, you can also head to ballantine.com slash Fox Talks and you can connect with Ryan and his team to get your customized digital strategy video and analysis. Now this is usually valued at $500, but Ryan is offering it to all of my listeners for free. So make sure you head there before time runs out. So whether you're dealing with lead generation or marketing strategy, or just taking the day off, try to have fun. Because as I always say, if you're not having fun, why are you doing it? <laughs>